Hello all and welcome to our lunchtime webinar on pension funds, liability driven investing strategies and financial stability risks. My name is Iris Chu. I'm director of the UCL Center for Ethics and Law. And this is the research center that's bringing you this lunchtime webinar today. With us today will be a panel of experts who will speak on the liability driven investing strategies that pension funds have adopted as well as some legal and regulatory implications in relation to the recent episode of financial stability risks. Our lead speaker today is Dan Mikulski's partner at Lane Clark and Peacock LLP. He has extensive experience in investment advisory and consultancy for wealth managers and pension funds. And Dan will be providing us with an overview of the evolution and the positioning of the industry today. Following on that, we have two commentators who are legal academics who will speak on the financial stability risks of late that we have observed, as well as the legal and regulatory implications. Dr. Vincenzo Bavoso, Senior Lecturer in Law at the University of Manchester Law School, will provide an overview of the relevant entities, responsibilities and roles in this regard. Professor Ian McNeil, Alexander Stone Professor of Commercial Law at the University of Glasgow, will focus more on pension funds and the roles of pension trustees. We will have a Q&A session after the main session has finished, which will last for about 10 minutes towards the end of the webinar. So I highly encourage members of the audience to send in your questions and comments at any point in time during the proceedings, and we'll be gathering these questions and comments towards the end so that the panel can address them. So please feel free to send in your questions and comments through the Q&A function at any point in time during these proceedings. And without further ado, let me now hand over to Dan for the leading speech. Hello, good afternoon. Hi, everybody. Um, great to be here. Um, Iris, thanks very much for inviting me to speak. Um, you know, I'm always conscious um, speaking over lunch. There's always the risk of giving people indigestion. Um, so hopefully we can get through this talk on, on LDI without, without that happening, but, but no, no promises on that front. Um, so, so Iris has asked me to give a little talk, maybe 10, 15 minutes, just on some of the background uh, of LDI. And I thought I'd do that by way of a little bit of a story, a little bit of a history of the whole thing, kind of running back uh, really about 30 years. And, and the reason for doing that is I just think it helps understand why pension schemes, defined benefit pension schemes, were, were doing LDI, um, because that, that, that's a, a fairly nuanced um, question. Uh, and it provides a lot more insight in, into sort of where we are today. So. Um, I'm going to give that little a little history. Um, yeah, just quickly on me, as, as Iris said, I'm an actuary, I'm an investment consultant, um, and I've been working for about 20 years with um, defined benefit pension schemes, helping them um, with their investment strategies generally, but but also with LDI as a part of that. Um, and I, I, have, I do consider that a a really big privilege to, to have done that. Most defined benefit pension schemes are, are not for profit organisations, very focused on delivering benefits for their members, um, and it's a real privilege to um, to be able to serve them and, and help them do that. Um, so the story of, of LDI then. So I think really it starts in the 1990s is probably the best place to start the story. Um, you, you probably could start the story as early as 1991 um, when infamously Robert Maxwell um, died. And in the wake of his death, uh, there was a, a large hole in the, in the Mirror Group uh, pension fund. And that um, incident uh, prompted a lot of uh, general reflection, I think. And really set the scene for probably the next 25, 30 years of pensions regulation, focusing on security of members' pensions. Um, in the 90s, when companies went out of business, it wasn't uncommon for um, people to lose part of their pension when that happened, um, even in cases where there wasn't any, any fraud or anything involved. Um, and, and that was considered a bad thing. And so really the scene was set for a huge focus on security of, of pensions. And that, that re really continues to this day, really. And that, and that set the scene for, for, for a lot of it. Um, and as, as part of that, really, the, the, the big change there is that there are, there are two numbers that pension schemes care about, the defined benefit pension schemes care about um, more than any others. And it's not actually how much assets they've got in pound terms. The two numbers they care about um, beyond anything else are the funding level, that's a percentage, um, percentage of the assets as a percentage of the liabilities. So quite simply, if you've got 100% funded, then your assets are enough to meet your liabilities. 
according to certain assumptions. We'll come back to that. If you're 50% funded, then you've only got half the assets that you need to meet the liability. So the one number they care about a lot is the funding level. The other one is the deficit. The deficit is simply the assets minus the, the liabilities. Um, and that deficit is, um, broadly speaking, what has to be met by the, the sponsoring employer, has to be, be paid in. So sponsoring employers care a lot about that because that's that's almost like a debt that the sponsor has that they're going to have to have to sort of pay off. So two numbers really matter to, to pension schemes, funding level um, and the deficit. And what, what, one thing that's really crucial for both of those is that when I talk about the liabilities there, um, the, the liabilities of a defined benefit pension fund are, are of course, um, pension payments that run off often 50, 60, 70 years into the future. Um, different pension payments to, to thousands or maybe tens of thousands of individuals. So this really complex series of cash flows running out decades. And in order to, to sort of simplify that into one number, um, we put a present value on it by, by discounting that, which is a sort of relatively um, conventional, straightforward sort of actuarial, I guess, uh, technique to kind of take a payment that's due in the future and bring it back into sort of today's money terms. And that's how we can arrive at a value for the liabilities today. And what, uh, what pension schemes, what defined benefit pension schemes found was that these funding levels and these deficits, they were pretty volatile. They went up and down quite a lot. And what was driving that uh, wasn't so much the fact that the assets were going up and down a lot. The assets were going up and down a lot. They were invested in stock markets and those sort of things. The assets were going up and down a lot. But what was really driving those things was the discount rate being used to place that present value on the liabilities. Um, and that discount rate typically would come from, from the gilt markets, from, from bond markets. And the, the changes in the, the, the gilt rates were really driving really big moves um, in, uh, in, in the present value of the liabilities. And that's what was driving these big changes in the funding level and changes in the deficit. Um, and, and so th that's sort of at the heart of the question of, um, of, of, of LTI was, well, could there be a way whereby we do something on the asset side, which is what we can control, that creates like this mirror image effect where, whereby we can offset those changes in that discount rate. And, and that is essentially is what LDI is, um, is, is sort of trying to achieve. And so if we sort of go back to, to the story then in the 90s, so in the late 90s, you had a couple of pieces of accounting regulations that were on the way um, that were FRS 17 and IAS 19. And they made companies put the pension deficits on their balance sheet. Um, and that was really important because suddenly CFOs and management cared a lot about those pension deficits because they would appear on their balance sheet. And for a lot of companies, uh, particularly UK companies, actually, um, they were really important. They were massive. They were very volatile um, and they could be equal to the size or they could be comparable to the size of the market capitalization of some quite large companies. Um, it wasn't an exaggeration at certain points to say that some large companies in the UK were effectively you know, an insurance company with a small operating business um, attached. So, so that was one reason that CFOs and company management started to, to, to care a lot about the, the, the deficit. And then the, the other big th uh, thread, I think, through the 90s is this sort of actuarial financial economic theory uh, thread that was developed. Um, and there, there was a very important paper written in 1997 um, by three actuaries that um, it was very controversial at the time, actually, but um, sort of 10 years later, it had become effectively conventional wisdom, I think, and still is. And, and that was putting defined benefit pension schemes in a financial economic context uh, for the first time, really. So sort of effectively saying that, well, a, a defined benefit pension scheme is really like an annuity book. Um, and w in, for many, many years, many decades, insurance companies had been defeasing and matching their obligations under that. And so the, the paper sort of put forward that um, companies and trustees should should match and should defease their um, the, 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 the defined benefit obligations in the same way. And, and one reason why that, um, one, one reason why, why that became more relevant in the late 90s was that it, during the 1990s, uh, there was a lot of regulation that enshrined some of these benefits and made them much more contractual than they had been in the past. That there was reasonable discretion before that in terms of what schemes could actually pay people, certainly in terms of the increases. Whereas uh, the 1990s, back to this security point, that th these were enshrined in regulation, schemes had to pay certain benefits, they had to pay certain increases. Um, and so that really meant that, that um, they became these financial economic sort of entities um, 
a, a lot more clearly. And what you saw in 2001, famously, the Boots Pension Scheme moved all their assets into bonds. That's clearly one way you can address this question of the funding ratio and the deficit being very volatile, you can move all your assets into bonds. Um, that will achieve that matching because you're using those bond yields to discount your liabilities. So you'll get that mirror image effect on your assets and liabilities that you want. Um, so that was one of the early, um, the early transactions. But then a lot of pension schemes, they didn't want to move all their assets into bonds because they still had a, a deficit uh, to fill. They wanted to invest for the long term and, and use long term investment returns to, to help with that, that deficit. And, and so you, this is where you saw uh, leveraged LDI uh, developing. And in, in 2003, uh, you saw the first um, swap transaction that took place or sort of the first uh, leveraged LDI transaction. And what's interesting about these early ones is they were often driven by the corporate management um, and investment bankers effectively going to the corporate management and saying, look, that pension deficit you've got on your balance sheet, that's really volatile. That could go up and down an awful lot. Um, and we can do something that's going to um, that's going to stop it from going up and down or, or at least give it an offsetting effect. Um, and the solution wasn't particularly complicated. It was an interest rate swap, which is a fairly vanilla instrument, I think. Um, and that interest, that interest rate swap would give this offsetting effect on the asset side to what was happening on the liability side. So, so that was the, where really the first kind of swap base and derivative based LDI strategies kind of grew out of. That was because you were looking to, um, to, you know, to, to, to do LDI and also still invest some of your growth assets for, for growth. Um, and it was, I think, important to say that it was the company management um, pushing for that at the time, because uh, obviously that, that there's a big sort of um, the big sort of feeling that that regulators uh, forced LDI upon schemes, which I don't think is um, I don't think is entirely true, or at least it's, it's not it's not a complete um, not a complete picture. The pensions regulator was actually created in the Pensions Act in 2004. Um, so interestingly, that was that's the after LDI had started started taking off. And in 2004 Pensions Act, you had the pensions regulator created and the, the pension protection funds created as well, which provides protection for the companies that, the, the, the pensioners of companies that become insolvent. Um, and that very much set the scene for measuring these funding ratios, for doing valuations, for focusing on the funding ratio as a key thing. And during the 2000s, then what you had was a lot of schemes were closing to new members, um, partly effectively because they were becoming very expensive for companies to run because um, longevity was was really improving, um, which meant they were very expensive benefits to give people. Interest rates were falling, so they became more expensive benefits to give people. And equity markets, you had that long um, sort of bear market in equities in the early 2000s. So th these defined benefit pension schemes became just, just much less tenable for schemes to run. So they were closing the schemes to new entrants. And that was also really key because when, when you've got constantly got new members coming into a scheme, the investment challenge is kind of investing for the long term in a kind of open-ended sort of way. Whereas as soon as you've closed the scheme and you've got a very defined set of um, members and therefore liabilities, the investment challenge is quite different. It's then very much focused on those kind of liabilities. So it was sort of that demographic shift of closing schemes, as well as the theory that had been developed in the 90s that kind of took hold through the 2000s and onwards, um, which is what caused LDI to... Um, to sort of really take off. So um, obviously 2008, um, financial crisis, and you know LDI did pretty fine by then. It had kind of already become fairly well adopted. Um, there were some schemes that I worked with that had swaps with Lehman Brothers, uh, for example, um, and they um, let those broadly worked out fine. They were collateralized, uh, which is important. Um, and it, it worked pretty well at that point. And what was happening by 2008 uh, was that it wasn't really the banks that were driving LDI anymore. It was more asset managers. So it became like a fairly conventional asset management offering that, that asset managers would, would run and they would use uh, derivatives or um, and bonds and other things to, um, to, to put in place those, those strategies. So by, um, so by 2013, industry surveys were showing something somewhere around 500 billion pounds of liabilities hedged. Um, and of course, we had the sort of QE decade, if you like, from 2012 onwards, where long dated rates just kept going down and down and down and down. Um, and that's generally bad for pension schemes because that really increases the present value of their liabilities and so really increases that deficit. So lots of corporate sponsors were looking at that saying, well, 
that means we're just going to have to pay more money in uh, because we have to fill that deficit. And so LDI really helped uh, during that period of time. Some schemes uh, did it early. Some schemes did it um, during the middle part of that decade. Um, and and while, while interest rates were falling, LDI put those schemes in a much better financial footing. It helped sponsors pay less into those pension schemes uh, and, it, and it contributed to the security um, of those benefits um, dur during that decade. Um, and during that period of time, the, the industry surveys again showed that LDI had, had grown to about a trillion pounds by 2019. Um, and the pension regulator recently um, said, they think it was about 1.4 trillion as of um, the end of last year. Um, and another another key difference that happened during that during that decade was that the focus moved from swaps to gilts as the basis of it, um, which is a fairly technical point, but obviously becomes relevant because of what happened um, in September October. Um, the gilts became the preferred sort of discounting approach of choice, and, and so it was more focused around gilts and um, gilt derivatives um, than, than than anything else. Um, and yeah, so uh, I mean, I'm probably wrap the story up then, just just by bringing us up to the current current moment. So, so but but sort of late um, 2021, you had interest rates at historic low levels, um, liabilities at historic uh, sort of high levels, and of course, whenever you're doing um, something that's that's levered, you have to really worry about collateral and the implications of um, that the market's going against you. Um, because of course, if you own an asset sort of outright, you can hang on to that asset come what may, it can go to zero and you can keep holding it to the end if you want to, it doesn't, that doesn't matter. If you, as soon as you've got leverage, you can't necessarily do that because there will become a point where you get forced out of that position if you can't keep putting collateral against it. Um, generally collateral is a good thing. That's what helped all the schemes that had those thoughts with Lehman. Lehman was posting collateral, so it's, everything was, was basically fine. Um, so you do want collateral to be there, but the fact that you need to post it um, is, is something that you need to factor in. So, so throughout this whole period of time, schemes would typically monitor the collateral they had. They would, would go through scenarios, what they would do if interest rates um, sort of rose. Um, so, so this was very much sort of known and was a big part of, uh, of my work was, was helping schemes sort of understand the implications of, of rising rates. And, and what you saw uh, this year was obviously rates had risen quite a lot in the first kind of half of the year. Um, and that had meant that um, schemes had to go th had been through a, a um, process whereby they would have to they had to place more collateral against these derivative positions in the first half of the year um, and that had broadly worked fine um, as I said there'd been quite a lot of planning that had gone into that uh, for quite a long period of time um, and so that that, that that kind of went fine that that sort of had happened by probably May June July ish um, and then over the summer schemes were kind of re um, re, re sort of um, refreshing those those uh, those plans um, and so, so what happened specifically in September was that I, there were two specific issues one was that the so the move higher in guilt yields was so much uh, faster and um, larger than what had happened um, before uh, but also schemes were kind of had already put plan a into action earlier in the year and so weren't in we're in a position where they were kind of um, um, sort of go, going to plan B, if you like, because plan A had already been uh, had already been sort of put into action. Um, so, so, so yeah, so you, you, ha you had a situation where generally um, higher interest rates are higher long term interest rates are, are good for defined benefit pension funds because it means the liabilities are lower. We had this LDI in place, which meant that we were actually matching that. So, so if anything, we should be indifferent now to um, to movements in interest rates is, is kind of the effect of LDI. Um, but you do want to make sure that you've got enough collateral. Um, to, to maintain these these hedges, um, and because of the the speed of the movement that you saw in in September, you had some um, situations where you were getting sort of forced liquidations. You were getting some some of these pooled funds that were getting forced out of some of their positions, um, and that contributed to this kind of um, uh, liquidation spiral dynamic, which um, you know, created a really disorderly market in gilts and, and, and the Bank of England needing to step in, as we um, as, as we know. Um, I, I will say that reflecting on it all now i mean the, the majority of schemes are in a better funded position than they were at the start of the year and that's important to say um it has been a pretty tumultuous couple of months for defined benefit pension schemes clearly um 
that there will be a minority, I think it's quite a small minority of schemes that are in um, a worse position that were negatively affected. It will be some, it's not, it's not the majority. Um, and of course, uh, every, everyone is reflecting on how, how best to run LDI strategies in the future and um, what, what, um, what, what suitable risk management um, looks like going forward. That um, that probably uh, probably pretty much uses up my time, but just, just maybe if I could just summarise a couple of points. Um, I think to, 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 to some, the, the ingredients of why LDI became um, became really popular were, um, were, were were multiple basically. So accounting rules made people care about volatile deficits. Financial theory uh, laid down in the late 90s. It later became adopted as as um, conventional wisdom by most most advisors and a lot of trustees. As schemes closed, the nature of the investment problem changed because the liabilities were fixed. Um, the first LDI hedges were done in the early 2000s, um, and the industry uh, sort of grew from there, uh, worked very well during the 2010s, um, and obviously ran into problems with collateral this year as rates rose. So I shall uh, leave it there, Iris. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, uh, for this very, very useful overview. Uh, can I now invite Vincenzo uh, to provide your comments and, and share your slides as well, please? Thank you for the, this very kind invitation. I'll, uh, I'll try to pick up from where uh, Dan left his discussion and just touch upon a few points. Um, so I'm not just going to cover all the slides. I'm just trying to focus on a few specific points. And namely, I think what I want to discuss here is the question of systemic stability or rather systemic instability. Where does it come from in the context of this LDI crash? And I think we have a couple of episodes that are very similar. One is quite recent, which is the collapse of Archegos uh, roughly a year ago, which was based again on miscalculated leverage on specific derivative positions. And then from a slightly different perspective, uh, the IRS, uh, the interest rate swap scandal, which was a mis-selling scandal with, with, with very similar patterns in the US and in the UK. Uh, so I'll just keep the background, which Dan um, did much better than I, than, than I do here. And I'll just start with the use of uh, swaps. So essentially, um, the timeline is quite critical. I think from the early 2000s, we know that derivative is a much liberalized market and derivatives started to be employed or embedded in a number of financial transactions. And uh, probably uh, it's worth picking from the last point I make in this slide. Essentially, we see a financialization of the pension system. And um, it's also true that, uh, as Dan said, this is an industry in particular where LDIs through swaps performed very well throughout the global financial crisis of 2008. They use, of course, of course, past historical data. And the first critical point to make here, the first question to, uh, to raise is, and I've, I've read a lot of comments from the industry saying this was a black swan, uh, the consequence of the minute budget could really not predict, could not be predicted. Um, and that's the first point I would like to make. So while, yes, the consequence, the adverse consequence and the massive swing in the price of the underlying commodity uh, probably could not be predicted, yes. However, you know, when you have such leverage position, can we always assume that there's always going to be a good day and never a bad day? Because obviously the higher the level of leverage, as I will say in the next few slides, uh, the greater the risks, the greater the benefits, but also the greater the risks. So I think I'm surprised that these uh, th these are um, elements that are never modeled in these quantitative um, models. Now, uh, a bit of context. So I will swap. So generally, there are three types of instrument that uh, raise concerns when it comes to systemic stability. Interest rate swaps, uh, total return swaps, and which is more specifically what was being used, the instrument that was being used in Archegos and, and, and some type of repos, okay, guild-based repos. I'm just gonna focus here on interest rate swaps. So the way it works here is that there's an exchange essentially of payment flows between two counterparties. In our case, one counterparty is the pension scheme, the other one is an investment bank 
which will balance that hedge or bet with another counterparty with a different, with a mirror image uh, position. In the context of this type of IRS, it involves exchange, exchanging a variable rate of interest with a fixed one. And typically the pension scheme will receive a fixed interest payment uh, for a specific period of time over a notional asset, which in our case is a gift or a bond. Uh, and then over the same period of time, over the same asset, the pension scheme will make a variable interest, which is commensurate to either LIBOR or one of its successors. Now, the critical thing here, which is also what entails higher level of leverage than desirable, and is essentially the, the idea of a partially funded instrument or a capital efficient instrument. And that's what derivatives achieve essentially, because effectively the underlying asset never changes hands. And that's what creates the synthetic exposure that derivative uh, achieves, okay? Um, in principle, neither side of the swap, so they're, ne they're neutral. But then, of course, the value of the swap changes with changes uh, with, with shifts in the underlying um, in the underlying asset. So the bond in this case. So effectively, what happens here is that with an increase in interest rates, in this example, the pension fund will have a position that, as we say, is out of the money. So it will have to pay on the swap. Okay, so the swap will become uneconomic. And obviously, the measure of that in the money or out of the money is tied to the level of leverage that we are thinking, that we are trading with. And that, that's the other point of leverage and interconnectedness. And there's been a lot of commentaries uh, as to how leverage can be managed. Um, now, um, I'll, I'll, obviously, the, 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 the way in which this industry and the employment of LDIs have become mainstream in the last few years is something that Dan uh, already mentioned. I don't need to repeat it, but essentially why such level of leverage was engaged with. And that's something I will uh, mention again. And obviously the higher the level of leverage, the greater the profitability of the LDI scheme and of the pension scheme as a whole, but also the greater the risk. And that brings back to the point of modeling. Can we model wrong way risk? Can we model specific dramatic shift in the price of the underlying assets? Uh, now, the way in which these problems have been managed, uh, if we think about managing uh, leverage over the last few years, specifically after 2008, is by mandating a clearing obligation of derivatives through central trillion counterparties. Now, before the global financial crisis, before 2010, in fact, all these derivatives were traded over the counter. So the problems were two. One, lack of transparency, and the second one, uh, widespread counterparty credit risk. Counterparty credit risk is synonymous of uh, systemic problems, systemic risk. Now, CCP is essentially uh, tackled both problems basically by mandating a margin obligation on the central clearing counterparts. Okay, so the, the CCP is backstopping potential and current future losses because the counterparties have to post initial and um, subsequent collateral. However, is this the answer to everything? And I think Dan pointed to a number of problems, uh, unintended problems, that are actually caused by, uh, by the, the system of margin calls. Because when the value, when the shift in the price of the underlying collateral changes in ways that are unexpected, that creates liquidity risks. So in essence, we can say that the system of margin calls and call for cash, which is what happened with the LDI crisis, uh, is fueling liquidity prices. So margin calls and the system of posting margin is not the answer to everything because essentially if the counterparty that is out of the money in the derivative is requested to post more, more to post more 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 cash a greater margin call then we have a situation where that counterparty will either risk defaulting or we have to sell assets in order to meet that demand for cash and selling assets 
further fuels the liquidity spiral. Okay, now again, this is not something new that we have seen with the LDI prices. It's something that has been happening again and again over the past 25 years. Okay, this, this, there's nothing new here. Um, so essentially, while derivatives in nature are hedging instrument, and when I say in nature, probably we have to go back many years. Yeah, because the origin of derivatives is agricultural hedging products. But here they become systems, they become tools, transactions that few that, that further fuel uh, interconnectedness between different elements of the financial system, different parties in the financial system, and they emphasize vulnerability and systemic risk. And CCPs, while having made the system safer in some respect, we also have to realize that they also create some level of moral hazard because they concentrate mutualized risks. And that brings me to the last bit of my comment, which is why do we engage, especially in this section of the industry? So we're not talking about a private hedge funds, a small hedge fund, such as Archivist, for instance. We are talking about the pension industry. Why engaging with levels of leverage which are higher than desirable? Now, I've read in most reports that these pension schemes and these LDIs were achieving levels of leverage of three or four to one, which, according to some people, is already a level above what would be desirable. But I've also read <clears throat> that some funds were trading with levels of leverage of 20 to one, which I think is quite crazy, because then, obviously, if, if you factor that level of leverage, really even small shifts in the value of the underlying assets such as bonds in our case, can cause disaster. Okay, so the level of capitalization of these pension schemes would need to be very, very high in order to withstand these shifts. So who advises in this sense? And that brings back probably to what Ian is doing uh, in a moment, which is the role of advisors. And uh, what are the incentives that are intrinsic in the asset manager industry? And as we know, uh, there's literature on asset manager capitalism. This has become a critical part of the way in which the financial system works. Um, and then the question, I think, is not only on the duties of asset managers, but also on the interplay between asset managers that effectively advise trustees. So the question would be, are trustees valid gatekeepers of the advice that they receive from asset managers? And the, the fear here is that the complexity of this industry, of the derivatives that are used here, the complexity of this advice legitimizes the role of the asset managers and also the, the fees that they receive. And it becomes a type of advice that is very difficult to second guess or to critique. And I'm not going through the duties. I think it's something that uh, Ian will do better than me. But I think it, I think it's quite critical that when we talk of duty of care of asset managers, uh, how do we measure that duty of care if not by standard to by 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 the general standard of what the industry does or what of what is widespread in the industry? So the accountability uh, exercise becomes quite feeble, quite difficult. And then just some final, very final thoughts. Uh, essentially, here we see, I think, a struggle between two policy priorities. One is the financialization of another element of society, in this case, the pension system, um, which has become a critical cog in this exercise in achieving financial deepening. Again, what Dan said, which is essentially uh, following the orthodoxy of uh, finance theory. Uh, and so the pension system has become trapped in leverage and liquidity dynamics. And on the other hand, we have the other priority, which is a social welfare one, which is ensuring the stability of the pension system for the benefit of, uh, of pensioners. Um, and then the critical question would be, do we really need derivatives to ensure that funding stability? And uh, a very critical point at the end, which is my last one, uh, I mean, the instability in the bond market is what really motivated the Bank of England to stabilize that and to intervene. If there is that perennial public backstop in, in financial services, in the financial markets, 
uh, can we use that uh, in, a, in a preemptive way, in an example way to stabilize the pension system? Obviously, this is an oversimplification, but it's just a bit, a bit of uh, food for thought. Uh, thank you very much, and um, uh, looking forward to the next presentation. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Vincenzo, uh, for for your uh, wonderful insights. And and I'm sure that uh, there will be things that uh, Dan might want to respond to in terms of uh, some of Vincenzo's um, perspectives regarding the asset management uh, industry. I mean, some some thoughts I think I I would echo as well. Um, but uh, without further ado, let me now invite uh, Ian uh, to come and uh, give us his thoughts. Um. So thanks to both um, Dan and Vincenzo for um, laying a, a very uh, clear foundation that makes it a lot easier for me to, um, to run through my contribution. Um, I'm going to focus on um, legal duties, and, and by that I mean primarily um, common law duties. Um, I think you know what's interesting about focusing on the common law is that we're dealing with relatively open-ended principles by comparison with some of the much more detailed regulatory rules that apply to pension schemes, which are probably amenable much more to the compliance um, sort of process that, that one would find um, within both um, pension funds and asset managers. And for that reason, I, I, I start from the perspective that legal risk probably is greater in the context of these um, common law duties than in the in respect of the more detailed um, regulatory rules. So I'm going to I'm going to deal with a few characteristics of LDI, which I think are um, relevant for the mapping of LDI strategies onto um, legal duties. Um, I, I, I just pass over a little bit because we've dealt with it, but I'll, I'll show the graph on LDI and asset allocation. Then I'll give a very sort of high level view of um, fiduciary duty and duty of care. And I'll finish up by posing what I think are three key questions um, that arise in the context of um, LDI strategies and give some tentative answers. Um, they are very tentative because you know, we're, we're working on the basis of limited information here. And um, you know, as, I'll, as I'll mention as I go on, one always has to pose questions around legal duties in the context of a specific scheme with a specific trust deed and a particular set of parameters within which it operates. So Picking up on some of the elements that have already been mentioned, um, the, there's three elements, I think, that map into the legal duties. The first is the issue of volatility and long-term returns. So, you know, as we've heard, LDI limits the volatility of pension valuation on the sponsor's balance sheet. Um, but over the long term, it sacrifices equity returns. And I think you know, that would remain true over most um, long term um, periods, although clearly, as, as has been mentioned, there have been um, some periods where perhaps returns on bonds um, have been better. The second point is leverage. And I, I preface my, my mention of leverage with hidden because you know, one point to bear in mind here is that pension funds are not generally permitted to borrow um, explicitly. But what we see LDI achieving is implicit or embedded leverage is achieved through repo and derivative transactions, as um, uh, Vincenzo had um, described. And then thirdly, and linked to the leverage, we see um, liquidity risk, um, sector-wide asset concentration, um, probably um, adds to that. In other words, the, the broad movement towards um, LDI, which um, Dan had described. And as he said, this liquidity risk is arising even um, in a situation when overall solvency across pension funds is um, generally quite strong. Um, and you know, linked to that, the idea that um, liquidity buffers um, are too low to cope with unusual market stress. And Vincenzo 
um, delved into the issue of just how um, unusual this might be considered to be. I thought this graph was quite interesting. Um, doesn't go quite as far back as Dan had covered in his um, analysis, but it does give a sense of how um, asset allocation has been driven by um, LDI strategies going from, you know, what you see in 2006, the, the old style sort of 60-40 type of portfolio was still around then um, in, in terms of the distribution between equities and, and bonds in particular. But by 2021, you see equities having um, been reduced to um, less than 20% um, of um, typical pension um, fund um, portfolios. So taking a high level view of um, fiduciary duty and duty of care, I think we can, you know, we can divide this up into two segments. So, you know, fiduciary duty, to my mind, maps most um, particularly onto um, LDI strategy. And in that context, I would focus particularly on the role of trustees in approving um, and adopting um, LDI strategies and linking to the point that Vincenzo made um, about the potential role of um, trustees as gatekeepers within the pension system. So probably as many of you would know, fiduciary duty focuses on proper the proper purpose, exercising investment powers for the proper purpose. And the, the kind of, you could say, the mirror image of that or the other side of the same coin is the best interests of beneficiaries. So these two legal principles work in tandem um, to protect the interests of um, beneficiaries. And then the second one, which attracts less attention, is the idea of fair treatment of different classes of beneficiary. And here, you know, we, we could draw attention to the, the recognition often of employers as um, beneficiaries under pension trust. So they can be um, either explicit beneficiaries according to particular pension trust deeds, or because of their interest in the overall working of the scheme, they could often be considered um, implicit or quasi um, beneficiaries in any case. Switching to the, the duty of care, and here I think, you know, this element is much more linked to implementation and the role of asset managers. We, we have the, the reference to the, um, the, the prudent person standard. That's focused on increasingly on um, portfolio risk, but it's not really addressed um, systemic risk, at least not in the case law, even if that um, has been something that perhaps has been um, the focus of attention in practice. Um, and I think, you know, going beyond the case law to, to consider more um, contemporary statements of the, the duty, I think we, we would say that conventionally it would be the duty to consider and address material financial risks to the investment objectives of the fund. And here, the investment objectives of the fund are the key issue because, you know, we're not looking at a at a sort of one size fits all um, type of um, objective um, across the, uh, the entire system. So the key questions that I see in this context, and I, you know, I, I pose them really by reference to legal risk rather than to there being any sort of clear um, answers in particular cases. Is there a risk that an LDI strategy does not comply with fiduciary duty? Is the first question. The second one, which aspects of LDI implementation might be implicated in a breach of duty of care? And third, how can we approach the coexistence of too little um, and too much risk in LDI strategy when um, evaluating um, legal duties? Now, that may be a little bit cryptic, but what, 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 I, what I'm referring to really with the idea of too little risk is the idea of the reducing exposure to equities. In other words, that um, trustees have endorsed approaches which have limited risk, but cut off growth prospects and improved returns over the long term. Too little risk, but too much risk is, is really referring to the 
implicit leverage that has been achieved within LG, LDI strategies, which to some extent one could say, you know, goes against the spirit of a of a sort of sector system of regulation which doesn't permit explicit um, leverage. So my, my sort of tentative answers to these questions would be to say, with regard to the first one, could there be a breach of fiduciary duty? I think possibly yes, um, with reference to proper purpose and fair treatment of different um, classes of beneficiary. And, I think the you know the the balancing that we're looking at here is you know to what extent does LDI favor the interests of the sponsoring employer in terms of attempting to reduce volatility while limiting the potential for growth um, that might work in the favor of um, beneficiaries. Now that's a pretty difficult trade-off and balancing act to achieve, but you know to my mind it's um, it, it, it does raise some issue of legal risk. I think on the second aspect related to duty of care, those aspects that, that all three of us have mentioned, leverage, um, asset concentration, inadequate liquidity buffers, I think they're all potentially implicated in this aspect. Um, and I think it's quite interesting to note that, you know, one sees post the September, October events, reports of a rethink of asset allocation by asset managers, perhaps indicating that um, you know, some elements of the implementation were not really as they should have been. And the third question, and you know, perhaps in some ways the most difficult um, in terms of sort of conceptualization of risk and how the law should approach re risk, um, you know, how do we approach this question of too much or too little risk? Well, I think to my mind, both forms of risk should be um, treated the same with reference to the fund objectives. Of course, the regulatory system, which I haven't really touched on, focuses much more on um, too much risk. In other words, protecting solvency from too much risk taking. Um, but to my mind, there's a case also for the these open-ended legal principles to focus potentially also on um, too little um, risk being taken. So I'll finish up on that point and um, pass it over for um, for discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, for, for your thoughts. I think if I may sum up uh, the, the general impression from the legal commentators is that um, that there is there is potentially quite a lot of legal risk um, that pension trustees may face um, where where uh, the recent turmoil is concerned, uh, and Vincenzo has also mentioned um, regulatory gaps, um, and um, and I think at this juncture um, I don't see any questions coming in from Q, from the Q and A function yet, and and I would like to uh, encourage our, our audience to submit your questions and comments if you have any. But if you don't mind, I might um, uh, start by um, raising a, a, a question of mine, and, and that deals with um, asset managers' incentives uh, in terms of how they advise and, and, and how, they, uh, how, how they advise pension funds uh, um, and DB schemes where, where um, LDI strategies are concerned. Um, I'm just wondering, following from uh, Vincenzo's comments, um, whether or not we have missed an opportunity uh, for thinking about um, the regulation of pension consultants. And I think I think that's an area that has been explored earlier in a law commission report, um, as well as by the, the BEIS at that time. And, and, and then it, it, it was kind of jettisoned and, and left. And with this uh, recent episode, would there be a case for revisiting uh, the roles, the power and influence of uh, pension advisors and pension consultants um, and I'm just wondering if Vincenzo would like to respond to that. And I'll also ask Dan to, to let me know your thoughts on them, whether or not you think this is necessary and what is your response to this? Thanks, Iris. Well, um, I think I, I can speak on the first part of your, um, of your um, question, which is the incentive. I think that, 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 that on the one hand, there's a there's an there's a hidden element of that problem, but at the same time, we've been seeing it 
uh, all along over the past 25 years, because we know that if you think about leverage and the use of derivatives to achieve leverage, at the individual level, these are extremely profitable uh, means to achieve greater return. But obviously, uh, if you are in the money, so if the if the bet goes well, or let's call it hedging, yes. Uh, however, if the derivative is out of the money, and there is an underlying negative scenario on the reference asset, obviously losses can be multiplied. So the derivatives multiply gains and losses. Now, the problem here is that um, advisors, and this is not just the only, uh, the only scenario where we have that, uh, they pocket all the profits of a positive bet, but they don't suffer the negative consequence of the negative underlying scenario. And that's why I think it's problematic when the excuse that is being used is saying, oh, this is a black swan and it was not modeled. Okay, I see that my image is frozen, but I hope you can hear me, yes? Yeah. Uh, so I think that is, that is the problem. The, the, the idea that there's no, there's a privatization of the profits and like an unaccountability of the losses. Now, uh, I think there's a more technical element to your question, which is how you regulate the advice within the pension industry. But I think it's uh, in, in financial, and I, I probably, I don't have sufficient information to address that question. But I think the question of incentive is one of those questions that where we have missed the opportunity after the global financial crisis. Because the idea of incentive has remained the problem of incentive has remained pervasive and ubiquitous out, out, across the financial system, whether it is corporate managers, whether it is advisors across different levels, and asset managers have become like they've become much greater in the way they exert their influence on all these sectors. So I think yes, there has been a missed opportunity, and I think the problem is probably greater than we had in the past. Uh, can I invite Dan to, to respond? I think a number of comments have been made quite critically uh, about the asset management industry, and I'd really like to hear your response. Yeah, no, I'm happy to. And, and maybe to build on what some of Vincenzo was saying, I think that is it, the, the problem of incentives and stuff is why it's important for independent advice to exist, independent of asset managers, right? And, and um, what, what happens is that you've got asset managers, you've got pension schemes, and then you have independent advisors, people like myself and, and others who, who sit in between. And I think it is important um, that the schemes re receive independent advice on the asset management products they're investing in. It's not the case that asset managers advise pension schemes. Um, and I think that's important that that's that, 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 that said. Um, I, I do take the points on complexity, actually. I kind of uh, to do agree with a lot of that. I think um, we should the whole industry should be reflective on the amount of complexity that gets introduced and and, and that that is um undeniably been a feature of the last um last sort of 10 15 years the, the one point i really wanted to make was on, on this systemic point because because you know, this is really important and this is what, what point we tried to make in our response to the um to the working pensions committee I think, I think there is a difference between managing individual a scheme managing its individual risks and the systemic risks of the whole industry. I, I do think you can separate those two things. Um, I, I don't think that you can expect every single scheme to act in a way that also safeguards the whole system. And I think that you do need to have a systemic element to the regulation. And what we've, and that, that's been lacking basically, but, um, you've had obviously three, three regulators that are involved here, um, TPR, FCA, and Bank of England. Um, and without going on, on at length, that there's, there's that there hasn't been any single one of them that have had the mandate, the grip, and the data to sort of act properly on, on LDI. And I think that's sort of what's what's kind of coming through a little bit. Um, as to regulation of consultants, um, yeah, I think it's probably inevitable. Um, I, it just wouldn't have changed anything in, in this um, situation though. So, so I think that's important to say. I don't think, just don't think consultants would have acted any different if they've been regulated or not. Um, it has always been seemed strange to me. I've been 20 years in this industry. It has always seemed strange to me that we're not more regulated than we are. Um, we are regulated, so it's not right to say that we're unregulated either. Um, but I, I just think it, it, there, there isn't um, the, the regulation doesn't sort of strongly affect every little um, every every single piece of advice we do in a lot of ways. And and I think um, you know, sure, I think consultants do wield a lot of power and influence. And I, I think we should. 
I accept that, 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 that maybe regulation is, is necessary. I'm, personally, I'm not someone who sort of believes that regulation is the solution to everything. Um, and as I say, I don't think it would have actually changed anything in this particular scenario. So um, I can see this being a catalyst for that question coming up again. Um, it's probably inevitable, but um, yeah, I don't think it would have actually changed anything. Thank you. Thank you, then, for your, for your thoughts. Um, we, we have a question uh, come in uh, from an anonymous attendee um, who asks, who has actually suffered the loss? Is it the pensioners or the corporate sponsor? And I think that that feeds into implications in relation to what uh, Ian has been discussing as well uh, in terms of uh, possible actions uh, against um, pension trustees. But I also feel a lot of sympathy for pension trustees um, because many of them are, are not exactly the financial experts uh, in that position. Um, and, um, and, and it's a very difficult situation in terms of pinpointing blame. Um, yep. So just wondering in terms of the who has suffered the loss and yep. some of the implications, would Dan take this and then followed by Ian? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really good question. That's a key question. And it, it's, it's not the pensioners, um, because you, you do have to remember that in these defined benefit pension schemes, you've got the pension, that you've got the trust of the pension scheme, which holds all these assets and pays out to, to the pensioners. Uh, and then you have the sponsoring employer who is, who is supporting that. So if, 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 you know, if I'm a pensioner or um, a member of one of these schemes, there's, there's the pool of assets that that scheme can draw on. But then if those assets aren't enough, the sponsor is required to, to meet that. And if the sponsor goes, then it'll go into the pension protection fund. So back to where I started from, the system is actually quite secure, I would say, from the perspective of the, the pensioner um, at this point in time. We, as, as I said, we had like 30 years of that sort of coming through. So um, I, I think the, it, it's not individual pensioners who suffered a loss. It, it's not it's not quite the corporate sponsor either, I suppose, um, because it's more the it's, if, if there is a loss, it would have been in the pension scheme itself. And the pension scheme could invest its way out of that loss by investing in growth assets and, and sort of growing that deficit. But but yes, broadly speaking, where there's a deficit in the pension scheme, it's ultimately the sponsor, the corporate sponsor, that's kind of on the hook for that. And that's a sort of a, a debt that's against the sponsor. Maybe the pension scheme can invest uh, over the long term, can invest its way out of some of that. But um, yeah, broadly speaking, if a pension scheme is worse funded, it's the sponsor who's going to be making those contributions. Um, it's not so much the actual pensioners that need to be sort of worried about that. Right, Ian, would you like to come in? Yeah, yeah, it, it's, um, I mean, I, I, I agree with what, what Dan has said, um, but I think, you know, I think there is, a, there, there is a, a touch of kind of waving a magic wand over what appears to be a loss. Um, in, in the sense that uh, you know the the idea that the you know the the immediate loss can be mitigated you know I, I think is is correct and obviously there there are obligations um, associated with doing that as well but I mean perhaps the you know the issue that we need to focus on here is not so much the the effect of specific incidents like this but rather you know the the long term um, implications of LDI versus other counterfactuals. Now, you know, as I think as Dan, you know, persuasively, you know, recounted in his, his um, sort of history of LDI, there are good reasons to, as to why we got here. Um, but, you know, there, there remains the question, is this the best place for us to be in terms of the pension system? Um, you know, with, with the delivery of um, pension benefits linked to the return on guilts in the long term, you know, it would would that be how we would design a system if we were starting from a blank page today? I'm less sure about that, um, and you know, so I think, you know, when when we're conceptualizing loss, we need to be careful about specifying what is the counterfactual and what is the objective of um, occupational pension schemes. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. There is a very late final question that has come in, but I think I think we can probably wrap up quite swiftly with this as well. Um, and, and it says, you know, if, if there is a loss, uh, wouldn't liability sit with the advisor? Because the advisor is the one that brings in the leverage LDI uh, stru structure for the pension fund concern. Um, I think the blame game is not, it's not easy uh, in, in, in this. And politicians are unpacking uh, this, this issue that the easiest um, target is the mini budget. 
but um, I, I thought that I might go round uh, to ask our um, panelists very quickly, um, who do you think would be chiefly uh, uh, responsible uh, for the recent turmoil? Um, shall we start with Dan? Um, yeah, the, that's, that's a big question. And as you say, I think it's it's a little bit reductive to try and um, identify one single sort of thing. I suppose I would come back to the system, need for systemic regulation. I think that's probably, and maybe to frame it slightly more positively in terms of what it needs to happen, I think is systemic regulation where you've got oversight of the overall amount of leverage uh, and making sure that's sensible is the key thing that could stop it, would stop it from happening again. Thank you. Um, Vincenzo? Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think the blame game is, uh, is, is it's impossible to attribute uh, specific responsibility. And I agree with Dan that individual entities act according to a, a TOC tragedy of common uh, rationale. You can't expect an individual entity to decrease leverage just because just to be a good citizen. That's not how the financial world works. But I think the, the, the mini budget is not the cause. It's just the trigger. And if it hadn't been that, it might have been something else. When you when you hide, uh, when you layer so many risks in the financial system, then anything can trigger disaster. So I think the mini budget, without getting into the politics of it, was just the trigger, not the cause of the turmoil, I think. Thank you, Vincenzo. And Ian will have the last word. Yeah, I, I I agree with what's been said in terms of the you know the the, the most um, pressing need, which is which is regulation. But um, I I think I I wouldn't ignore the the private law um, liability scheme because not in terms so much of litigation, but actually in terms of driving change. That you know I think it provides a sort of it provides some kind of benchmark against which to you know assess whether appropriate decisions are being taken. Thank you, thank you, Ian. Uh, thank you all my wonderful speakers today uh, for giving of your time and for elucidating on this rather complex uh, uh, corner of uh, financial instruments and financial capitalism. Uh, and uh, we have benefited greatly uh, from uh, Dan's overview, as well as the legal discussions that Vincenzo and Ian has provided. Um, for all of you online, uh, this will be streamed on YouTube uh, at some point in time. Uh, thank you all for joining us today and thank you for the questions that came in and have a very good rest of the day. <laughs>